All right, hi everyone. Basically, I just come off an interview that I was uh, conducting with Andrew. Andrew is a super smart, super sharp guy, value investing focused. And basically that's a new format I'm once again introducing to the channel. The interview ended up being quite long. I think we uh, ended up talking for over an hour about the importance of having a simplified investing approach. We were talking about lots of different individual companies. We were talking about valuation mistakes investors tend to make and also the evolution that Andrew as an investor has gone through. I think there are a lot of very valuable pieces of advice in that interview. So I would really appreciate it if you take the time to watch it in full length. And of course, um, if you share some of your thoughts on the topics we discussed, that would be great too. And with that being said, let's just roll the interview. All right. So, uh, Andrew, welcome on the channel. It's uh, basically the first interview ever I do on this channel. And uh, I want to thank you for, for making the time um, to discuss stocks today. Um, let me just introduce you real quick. You shared a few um, information about you beforehand. So you actually used to run a YouTube channel yourself, uh, which you started in 2019 and then stopped in 2020, so early 2020, if I remember correctly. Uh, 2022, yeah. Oh, 2022, sorry. I yeah. Like that. Um, and you said the main reason was that you felt a bit frustrated um, that people want to get a short fix, like ideally maybe just stock tips and don't really appreciate the educational content as much as you maybe uh, would have hoped. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that that was the beginning of it, and then uh, life took over as well. I was I was losing my passion for it, and then uh, as I was explaining, we our lease was up on our apartment, so my wife and I were trying to house hunt, and then we also got married that same year as well. Um, so throughout late twenty twenty two, that's what we were doing, and then twenty twenty three has just I haven't but I haven't gotten back into the uh, the YouTube category just yet because we've just been doing so much work on the house and yeah. everything. But I told Andrew before the interview that uh, I have no doubt that he will eventually be back in the YouTube stock market game. Yeah, hopefully. 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 I, I hope too soon. Yeah. Obviously, you, you follow um, a value investing philosophy too. Um, you might in a second explain how we two got in, in touch with each other. Um, we've discussed a few stocks already, like maybe more general investing concepts and my perception was that or is that you are incredibly competent when it comes to stocks and maybe investing in general uh, very well spoken to and um, i hope i can pick your brain a little bit on on some general investing topics today so andrew can you maybe just start to like sharing how we two got in touch with each other uh, yeah so well i actually started I, i've been subscribed to your youtube channel for a while uh, I, I think you put out extremely high quality content. Um, Thank and you. Same you very, when, when you came across my channel? I, I don't. I know it was several years ago, though. It was, it was, oh, okay. it was early. You, you might have only had maybe six or seven videos at the time. Oh, wow. so it, was, it was relatively early on. Yeah. Um, and I just remembered. It, and I don't think it was the first video where I ended up subscribing. Usually it's it never is. It's usually second or third. And I'm like, oh continuously puts out good content so so then i ended up subscribing um and it wasn't actually until uh, the release of threads <laughs> where threads came out um and i remember i i ended up following you on threads and on, on threads we could end up communicating a, a little bit better um, were you not on, on twitter or x before no i never i had a twitter back when i was a teenager but i i just never got into it uh so i was on it for maybe a month or so um yeah so i, I decided I, I am an investor in meta so naturally i had to give threads a a shot um so yeah i followed you on threads uh and we kind of got in touch there uh and from there we moved it over to chatting privately on instagram and then from there chatting on whatsapp and uh now now i say we've become uh relatively mutual friends via the internet so yeah, that's amazing. Story. Actually, really enjoy that getting to know people which you would otherwise never like get in touch with, uh, just because you share like a very niche passion. Of course, oh, I don't know what's sure. like in your yeah. social circle, but in my social circle, basically no one is into active investing. 
No, um, I have my best friend is is like lifelong best friend. He's learning. Uh, I'm I'm slowly teaching him. He's trying to get into it now. Um, but relatively speaking, yeah, no no one does. Um, but do you, and if they do, said, it's like Bitcoin. I think you said you are in touch with investing with Tom, and I think. Uh, yeah. So, so investing with Tom, he, he ran and don't, I, I don't want to hype up my relationship with him that much. He, if I want to reach out to him, he'll always respond. Um, but He's like he a has, nice guy, I have to say, oh, he is top quality, super top quality. Um, but we did a, um, it, it was a fundraiser a few years ago. He had a bunch of value investors on. Oh, like uh, the it was like it, thing, right? Yeah, it was the no November. shave no of uh, the uh Movember thing. Yeah. Um fundraiser. So so I was on there and that's how I got to know Tom. Um but he, yeah, he's a super top top notch guy. Um and then yeah, aside from investing with Tom, uh my closest uh, you could call it internet friend once again in the investing circle is is Andrew Brown, who also runs a, a YouTube channel. Uh, once again, super top notch guy. Have nothing bad to say about him. Um, he and I are by far, I, I would say, the closest. And and every investing idea, uh, I'll I'll end up bouncing off of him. But I think that's very important is to kind of increase your circle, but still have a small circle of guys. But but um you know, at least have someone that you can bounce ideas off, off of, which I think it's great that, you know, you and I have connected now and yeah. we do similar things now. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So we were basically brainstorming ideas, like what we could focus on in this video. And you brought up maybe the idea of the simplicity of your investing approach. Um, mm -hmm. So can you maybe just outline very briefly the core philosophy of your investment approach and maybe explain in a way so that a beginner investor could understand it for sure so i like to buy simple quality businesses um that typically typically i'm either a large consumer of or a large uh, user of mm -hmm. um and I, it by doing that it allows me an edge over wall street so so one of my bigger investments right now um is the boston beer company and I understand the trends before um, before Wall Street ends up n noticing those trends. It's it's nothing that's in the financials, and it will show in the financials far later. So when the hard sell set category was slowing down, I saw that happening far before Wall Street did. And then there's also you know other stories with other brands that they own, such as Twisted Tea, that are taking off like a rocket ship but it's not shown in the financials just yet. So, so different things like that. Another investment of mine was Yeti. Um, you can just walk right into a Dick's Sporting Goods and you can look at the entire wall of Yetis there that they have. And you can just sit there and you can just, you know, I sometimes I look like a creep, but on my Saturdays or whatever, I'll just go into a Dick's Sporting Goods. And then like someone will walk into the Yeti section and they'll just start, they'll just start looking at Yetis. And then I just start, talking to them i'll just start picking their brand about why they have yetis or why they like this brand versus other brands and stuff um beverage companies are easy to follow because you can just walk into a grocery store and you can just look at the aisles you can see who's getting the end caps who's in the refrigerator section if they're out of the refrigerator section that's usually the kiss of death you know what i mean which we've seen a lot with like bud light and stuff lately so it, it, it just very simple businesses that i don't need to be a wall street genius to understand uh, so it usually ends up being consumer-based uh products um another kind of, you know similar meta I, I use all their social platforms right so so very just um simple businesses to understand and uh, things that you know you, you grew up you could have grown up and just kind of saw the trends before your eyes you don't need to read a financial statement to really understand the strength of the business you know Awesome. Yeah, what this kind of reminds me of is um, that two stocks that I kind of got suggested in a way on on X recently, or that pop up in my feed quite recent, quite frequently, are Ulta Beauty, and uh, right now, obviously, Dollar, Dollar General, mm -hmm. which I think could both end up being attractive in terms of valuation right now. But as I'm not a consumer, and they have no stores here in Europe, or at least not in Germany, I don't think I would ever feel comfortable investing in them because I don't really understand the consumer behavior. Does that yeah, I, yeah, that that makes perfect sense. Um, Dollar General was actually one I I was looking into. Um, but as as we'll get more into, uh, I I don't like debt. 
and Dollar General has a lot of depth. The interesting thing with Dollar General is they go wherever Walmart won't go. They 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 just they just go okay. Where will Walmart not go? Okay, and that's where we're gonna go, and we're gonna discount there. Um, so they, they Dollar General has a moat, but they have a, a lot of debt, which I I don't like debt at yeah. all. <laughs> yeah. So to sum up what you said so far, simple, understandable. Um, you ideally are a consumer and low debt, right? Anything mm -hmm. to add to that? Uh, no, that's that's pretty much it. I call it. I call Probably it. Probably the... like like what I'm thinking of is I think in our conversation conversations you uh, frequently highlighted that you like founder led companies, right? So I guess that's maybe another pillar. Yeah, founder led companies. It doesn't have to be a founder led company, but that that gives me something to hang my hang my hat up on. Um, typically, because if a founder created and bootstrapped a phenomenal business from scratch. And I mean a phenomenal business, meaning that, you know, it's growing, it's relatively low debt. Um, they they have, you know, some form of either brand strength or some kind of moat. And that was all strictly due to the founder. Um, usually that founder is, you know, winners continue to win. Um, so I, I like to hang my hat up on those guys. Whereas um a lot of times a hired gun and stuff that they, they have more short-term motives and everything. And I'm not saying that the founder has to be the CEO, um, Boston beer. A lot of the companies I, I own, the founders, not the CEO, but they're still majority shareholders and active in the day-to-day -day operations. A, a lot of founders actually don't make good CEOs. So um, you just have to kind of dig, dig it into the weeds there a little bit. Perfect. Yeah. And so what does the research process look like? You just mentioned that you actually like, for example, say it's a, a retailer going into the store, talking to customers, maybe talking to salespeople. Uh, is that yeah. something you would start with or where, where do you start and what are maybe some of um, the subsequent steps? Yeah, so so my initial research process, my initial from finding a company to actually putting it on my watch list and then diving deeper takes probably five minutes at the most um usually i'll i'll e either hear of a company i'll come across a company via i'm constantly you know on on certain investing apps and i'll just see largest movers of the day and then you know that's a good way to just find companies and if a company stands out to me like oh hey i've heard of that brand before um and then i'll go check the financial so if their revenue is consistently growing uh they have low debt um and it's a company that you know, I, I kind of already know, and I think that that trend of growth will continue, then that's it. I'll add it to my watch list. Um, and then, and then I'll get around to digging uh, deeper into the company. Um, so yes, usually the, the first thing after that is I'll go on the website, read the 10 K's, 10 Q's. Um, and then I, I at that point, if it is a consumer brand or something and, and it's in grocery stores or in retailers or, or whatever it is, um, then and that's when I will start just driving around uh, to stores. Because um, a lot of the times these websites, if they're a consumer brand, so so another one I'm drinking right now, Vitacoco, um, if you go on their website, mm -hmm. most brands nowadays will say, find find the product near me so all you have to do is just go on enter your zip code and then it tells you all the stores where where they are around you and then i'll just drive around to all of those stores and see what their sell through rate is compared to the competitors i'll see how much shelf space they have compared to their competitors um it's a very scuttlebutt approach um it's, it's very scuttlebutt so yeah and, and that may actually give you an edge right because how many investors actually go that extra mile Wall Street won't at all. Wall Wall Street won't do that. And no. most most retail Not investors at all. probably either. most retail investors won't either. Um, th that's a thing. Re there's retail investors, and then there's obsessive retail investors. You need to be if I think if you're going to do this with any form of su success, you need to be obsessive. You have to have an addictive personality, and you need to focus, focus, focus. Um, yeah, I think if you're doing this just as like a side hobby. I, I don't know about the uh, the overall long term su success you'll have. You need to like it needs to consume you. Um, yeah, honestly, I would I would agree. I really think so. It depends a little bit on your investing style. I think. Yep. I think you are also fairly quality focused, right? And I think when you super quality own, focused, yeah. I think when you own a lot of super high quality businesses, and the benefit is 
that once you have done the research, you can often just leave them in your portfolio for years. For years. So it will be a lot of work up front, but then the yep. tracking of the business is much less time consuming, I would, I would say. Yeah. And, and what I enjoy about that approach, I think you might actually end up be doing better, like especially as a, as a small investor by maybe turning over your portfolio more frequently and maybe the small and micro cap space, but that's so much more time consuming. And mm -hmm. there's probably also more room for error, I, I would argue. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've started, uh, I used to do so many different things until I stumbled upon this approach too. So, I mean, it's just kind of plug and play and find what works for you. My approach won't work for everyone. And that would actually be my, my next question. So that's a, a very good transition. What drew you to the, to the concept of value investing in the first place? Um, yeah, so, so value investing, well, the typical sense value investing was my stop prior to where I am now. So I, I call myself more of a rational blue collar investor, rational long-term investing versus value investing. But the traditional value investing was my stop before where I am now. So I started off uh, 20, probably late 2018, tw no, 20, 2017. I started off in the stock market and it was I didn't know what I was doing. I I started off day trading. I thought that was interesting. So I was trying to day trade. But um, my profession is I, I run a gas crew and we install gas mains in the ground. Guess what? You you have to stay focused when you're installing gas pipe in, in the ground, right? So I couldn't I couldn't be day trading. I couldn't be focusing on on the uh, on my phone or on a computer 24 seven. Uh, so day trading wasn't going to work. Um, then so, I thought, so if I may, may just ask one question here, what attracted yeah. you to day trading? Was it like the illusion of getting rich quickly or, or uh, uh, probably? Yeah, I, I, I would say that was probably it. Um, and then, and the fact that I didn't have to hold everything overnight for some reason, I thought just overnight, like things got crazy. So you're in and you're out and you don't yeah. have to hold anything overnight. Um, and then the exact opposite approach took place when I got into swing trading. It's a version of day trading, but you're trying to you're 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 lengthening the charts and you're trying to buy big dips. So for example, maybe a dollar general. Mm -hmm. You find a dollar general coming down, you find you find a support level, and then you sell it when it gets back to whatever the next support level is, yeah. regardless of the valuation or anything. You know, it was just moronic. And and same thing, that didn't suit well with me because I was hanging my hat up on just charts. There was no fundamentals to it. I was always like waiting for to come up with an approach that had like a fundamental proven record to it. Um. So so yeah, the swing trading didn't work. So I don't know. I got into traders, but I guess uh, like what you described just now is um like the term conviction pops up in my head. I, I would yeah. find it very hard to develop conviction in an investment solely based on certain chart patterns. Yeah, it, it was, it didn't sit well with me. And I, and I found that out very quickly. Um, so then I, then I got into my curiosity peaked and I was like, oh, well, what about, I think at this point, then I was starting to come across, you know, Warren Buffett's and the Peter Lynch's and stuff. I didn't really know too much about them. Um, but I was like, oh, people can just pick stocks. Like imagine if you picked Apple back in, you know, mm. 2004 or something like you'd be, you'd be. Rich. doing very very well exactly or picked amazon or something so i was like ooh, but i didn't have a process i didn't have a process whatsoever so i was just thinking i remember one of one of my investments you could call it it was like a random stock pick i was going on and i was looking at like wall street journal articles and just ran random different things yahoo finance articles different write-ups and one was like a robotics company that i knew absolutely nothing about but they created um i quite frankly don't even remember what they created yeah. it was some type of robotics company and I, I i was just like constructing my portfolio based on like these out of left field ideas no fundamentals whatsoever um so that didn't work and then i lost it wasn't a lot of money, but a lot of money for me at the time. Yeah. Um, and then, so I went from there to portfolio construction and just buying different ETFs. But instead of just buying the Vanguard S&P 500, I was buying like all these crazy ETFs, like low volatility ETF and like foreign ETF. And I thought like, I thought you had to be, you had to overcomplicate things to to be very successful. Um, How many once again, ETFs did you own back then? 
oh i don't know maybe 20 at one point it was just moronic yeah um th by the way this is all very quick learning this was all within I was about to ask like what kind of the time frame was from you starting to date rate to you arriving yeah. more at a value focused approach yeah i'm a very quick um i'll quickly quick pop up something yep. quick to adjust that that that's exactly what it is uh so so that didn't work out for me that well um, then I fell into dividend growth investing, which is actually a very common. We're getting closer. Style. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, okay, we'll buy quality businesses that have a lot of free cash flow. They're consistently growing. And wow, I can get paid every single, you know, if you, yep. if you structure your portfolio properly, you can get paid every month or whatever. Uh, and the compounding effects of that. So now I'm starting to think a little bit more long term. Uh, but once again, then there were obvious companies I remember thinking, but they didn't pay a dividend. But I was like, oh, that company... Because I was starting to learn about valuation and things at the time, too. And I'm like, that company is undervalued. That's going to do well. Sure enough, that company would go up 200% or whatever. Well, my portfolio was up like 10%. I was like, mm, I think I can start picking better businesses than just strictly focusing on companies that pay dividends. And then the whole concept, too, of a company, I, I think this is, I was really getting into Peter Lynch at this time and Warren Buffett. And they talked about dividend payers. They're only going to pay a dividend if they have nowhere else to reinvest their capital. And I was like, oh, well, that that made sense to me. Now now the dots are starting to connect. So then I got into more traditional value investing, um, trying to find low priced businesses, but with a less focus on quality. And same thing that didn't sit well with me because there was no floor to those businesses. I was like, okay, it's it's statistically cheap, mm -hmm. but who's to say it can't go cheaper? The the underlying value of that business isn't growing so that support level isn't growing at all um and that's ultimately i stumbled into to where i am now which is buying growing businesses quality businesses and trying to buy them for cheaper than than what i feel that they're worth and and you know every couple of years i'll add a different um a different check a uh, different yeah. check into that checklist uh as you know, so I didn't used to worry about the debt levels. I thought debt to equity was okay to look at. Now I look at real debt compared to cash. And if they have more real debt, meaning uh, lease lease liabilities and stuff or deferred revenues, that's that's not real debt. Mm -hmm. um, but real debt that can put them bankrupt. If they have more real debt, then they have cash and short term investments. Normally, I just won't even bother looking at the company. Because you can't go bankrupt without debt. So yeah, yeah. For me, the the threshold I would say is like maximum three to four years of uh, free cash flow. So I would like yeah, which is this. that's a standard way a lot of people look at it. That would still, that be that's too much for you. That would be too much for me. Yeah, yeah. I I don't like that at all. And and, and the reason the universe a lot already, which is great, I think. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Awesome. Like earlier, you said that. Sometimes you might find investments where the attractiveness of the investment might not be reflected in the numbers yet. I think that's in a way you're what you're talking about just now too. So not just not necessarily low uh, multiple stocks. Um, so what could be reasons of the maybe attractiveness not being reflected in the numbers yet? Like I have two things in my mind. So one could mm -hmm. be cyclicality, right? So maybe we're at uh, the bottom of, of the of the cycle, or um, maybe the business is reinvesting quite heavily. And so the true profitability is not showing up in the margins yet. So are those two things? Any any other things that come to your mind? Um the second one, yes. The first one, I don't I don't buy cyclical businesses. I mean, for example, a company like Meta is so large now and it it's actually leveraged. It's synthetically leveraged to the business cycle now because it it relies pretty much solely on ad revenue. So it's synthetically yeah. leveraged to the business cycle now. And it's so big that it can't outgrow a cycle, you know, mm -hmm. not like it could have in 2008 or something like that. So, yeah. so you have to understand the business there, but other than like purely cyclical, cyclical businesses, um, I, I avoid because I don't think I have an edge over the people who are actually, you know, purely focused on cyclical businesses. That's not my edge. Um, I like, I like steady growth. I like businesses that go from one to two to three to four to five. You know, it's easy yeah. for me to count six, seven, eight, nine, ten at that point. Um, then businesses that go from one to zero, three, four, zero. And that's a, a great zero. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit more difficult for me to, I would to also that argue point. that most cyclical businesses, like very cyclical businesses, are probably also not super high quality businesses because because I think one. 
uh, characteristic of a quality business. Like something I at least like to see is like a somewhat recurring nature of revenue. Yep. Yeah, uh, there th there can be extremely high quality ones. Um, for example, I know uh, Thor, um, which I I'm not invested in, but that's one we we mentioned investing with Tom. Um, he's mm -hmm. he's largely invested into Thor, and I did dig into the business uh, Winnebago as well. Well, what is actually? I'm, I'm not familiar with. Uh, that. They, they they produce and sell RVs. Um, which is oh yeah, a, a very simple way of putting it. Yeah, it's it, it's a the very dumbed down answer, but that's the gist of it. They they but attached to the travel industry. It, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So they're naturally extremely cyclical, but uh, they they are high quality businesses, meaning that they essentially run in a duopoly, um, and so they have pricing power. Um, management is very solid. Uh, it's it's a very capital intensive business, but at the same time, they they run it in a very uh lean manner. Mm -hmm. Um. So so yeah. So you can find very high quality businesses in cyclical industries. It's just it's just not my forte. Yeah, yeah. and I think you have to be very dangerous, uh, careful, uh, when valuing those businesses because you kind mm -hmm. of assume or have a good guess on where we are in the cycle. Yeah, and Make that's sure not that's okay. yeah yeah that's not the strength of mine. Um, but going back to hidden value. Uh, the, the, the main thing I was referring to is, and the best example I can give, or two examples I could give, uh, one would be, well, let me start with meta first. Um, yeah. the, the hidden value with meta, well, sure. You, you might think I'm going to talk about the metaverse and everything. That's actually not, um, the real bazooka that they had is WhatsApp. Um, and all they would have to do is run the exact same playbook that they ran for monetizing Instagram and Facebook. Um, so that's hidden value that what that doesn't show up in the numbers yet. But yet they have, I mean, they have billions of WhatsApp users. And so it, it's just a very similar playbook. And th they could monetize that if they really wanted to. Um, and they just haven't, by and large, yet. Uh, so so that's a, a hidden value thing if you really understand your investment. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and I mean, all you have to do is watch interviews. I watch loads of interviews of CEOs and founders and stuff. And Mark Zuckerberg talks about WhatsApp being the, the next big platform for them. I know it sounds like he's always talking about the metaverse and, and things like that. But really, if you watch like behind the scene interviews of him, just that's not prepped and he's just talking off the cuff and everything, he's constantly talking about WhatsApp. Um, but on if you listen to an earnings call, no one asks about WhatsApp ever. So that's what I mean. Wall, Wall Street's not. I think he he thing. tends to bring it up like in the introductory remarks, right? Yeah. And then no one else yeah. asks. Yeah. It, exactly. Um. So it's the same thing with the Boston Beer Company, and this is the one where I'll have to show you charts and everything later that I've created. But uh, it, it, so Boston Beer Company, they own they own uh, several alcoholic beverage brands and the main thing that everyone talks about is either sam adams which is their legacy uh craft beer but sam adams is i think on a revenue basis if you actually break it down their smallest brand now it's it's so irrelevant to the overall growth of the business now mm -hmm. um or everyone was focused on truly hard seltzer during the hard seltzer bubble and hard seltzer went from nothing to the largest part of their business over the course of three or four years. Oh, wow. And then, and now it's just dropping back down to, I think from its peak, it's down, its volumes are down maybe 65, 70% or something. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like the business is, but, but that's weird because how the how largest much revenue is that product. Well, so, so it was the largest segment of their business by far. Mm -hmm. Only a few years ago, and the volume has dropped down. The sales volume has dropped down about seventy percent from its peak. Oh. Yet, over the past three years, Boston Bears Company has still continued to increase their revenue, mm -hmm. and that, that would make you wonder that it, that's a little fishy because it was over fifty percent of their business at the peak, and mm -hmm. it's down seventy percent. How are revenues still flat? How are they still slightly ticking upward? But Wall Street doesn't dig deeper into that. They just look at top line. They just look at, you know, headlines and, and everything. And that's it. Yeah. You dig deeper, you realize Twisted Tea, which no one talks about. They just only recently started talking about it uh, over the past few earnings calls, meaning Wall Street analysts and stuff. Uh, and Twisted Tea 
is actually their largest category now. And what the re what the total revenue of the business was in 2019, Twisted Tea will be doing more than that this year alone. And that's what Twisted Tea was a brand that they invented about 25 years ago, uh, about 20 years ago now, and has compounded 20 years every single year, year in and year out at 20 to 30% per year. And uh, naturally, that's going to start slowing down, but still compounding about 30% per year today. So oh. naturally, that's obviously going to slow down. But there's a massive growth story behind the business that it's doesn't hard to appear. see. Yeah, yeah, because because the company won't break down individual numbers. Um, they don't break down the individual brands' numbers. They just tell you whether that brand is up or down this year. They'll say our revenues are up this year with a negative impact from brand A, brand B, brand C, and a positive impact from brand D and brand F. You know. And where so, do you have the numbers from? Like the twenty to thirty percent uh, component growth. A ridiculous amount of research and plug and play with numbers and in, in um in Google Sheets. Uh, you had to look at different. You had to listen to old earnings calls where they mentioned growth rates from the prior year. They used to break down numbers, so I had to go all the way back to like two thousand and five and then extrapolate numbers because they used to break down numbers and then they stopped. I think you can also read like Nielsen reports, which every few years they'll give you total numbers and stuff. Um, or sometimes I had to break in total numbers of the entire category and then see what market share they had at that time. And that, oh yeah, it was a lot of work. Um, but now I cross-reference it to the earnings call and total revenue. And within, for the past two years, I've been within like a half a percent, like correct either way on, on all of their different brands. Um, have you I'm like this getting is... in touch with uh, investor relations because I would assume if you would ask their questions, would they? No, not they they, they won't they won't tell you I have. So I actually called them. I I work I'm only twenty minutes away from their headquarters, oh, and okay. uh, yeah, I, I I called and asked, and they don't like investor relations at all, which I love about them. That's oh, I I yeah. love I love that they're like all of our information is in our press release. Goodbye, <laughs> and like that's it. And I was like, oh okay. Oh, yeah, I was right. I was actually recently listening to a podcast. I don't remember who was was the guest, but he also said he was basically hunting in the in the small and micro cap space. And he said he loved it when the businesses don't even have an investor relations department. Mm -hmm. They would basically immediately get you in touch with one of the executives. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that would show that they the business is not overly focused on pleasing shareholders. Oh, they, they aren't at all. They're, they're very focused. They're very, very focused on pleasing consumers. They they don't really give a rat's ass about investors. Um, They they do to an extent, but like Wall Street analysts and stuff, they don't care. Like, I mean, the largest shareholder is Jim Cook, which is the founder. So, yeah. I mean, like, obviously they care about the shareholder, but they, they have a very... Um, they must also be a bigger company, right? What's What kind of market cap are we talking about? They're big. I want to talk too much on on Boston beer now. Yeah. I want to make this a Boston beer podcast. But yeah, yeah they're, they're, it's an oligopoly business and they're the smallest player in the oligopoly. So, uh, I mean, the biggest players think like Bud Light, um, you know, Anheuser-Busch uh, um, and uh, Miller Coors, brands like that, um, Ambev. So um, it's an oligopoly and they have the smallest market share. They have the smallest total market share in the oligopoly which has massive federal regulations in it and stuff. So there is a moat that's very difficult to, to come into this space without being acquired. Um, and they have the smallest total market share. However, every single one of their brands holds between a 50 and 85% market share. That's a cool statistic. Yeah. So so they have the smallest market share overall, but all of their brands... Oh, I lied, except Truly. Tr truly had it like a 50% share at one point. Now it's like a 25 but yeah. all of their other brands, yeah, are, are like own the the lion's share of the market share. Truly is the only one that's a number two. Awesome. So thank, thanks for sharing that. I guess not many in yeah. the audience are familiar with the business. Have you already established your position? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, to be my, fair, yeah, my, my YouTube my, audience is not going to, to move stock prices. Yeah, no, it's my second largest position behind Meta. Yeah. Awesome. So, so I was about to ask you, like, if we get back to the simplicity of your approach, if mm -hmm. any investments come to mind where like your focus on simplicity was kind of the driving force or like the main reason for for the success of an investment yeah my 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 biggest winners have all been it which is why normally when i stray off of that path I, i'm usually 
like like sometimes I'll I'll kind of get out of my comfort zone a little bit um and and sometimes they work out sometimes they don't mm -hmm. um but yeah my biggest winners have all been just super like obvious hit you on the head with a two by four type of investment so number one was was meta um which is by and large on a not on a total return uh, percent not on a percentage return basis but on a total return basis meta is by far my biggest winner um and that was you know i i've bought meta i've owned since 2018 and pretty much most dips uh, when you know the valuation makes sense, I, I I'll usually just end up adding to my position. Um, Were you ever and, questioning yourself on your meta investment on the way down? I'm. I I want to say like, no. Let me I, just say like I'm yeah. I'm a meta shareholder now as mm -hmm. well too, as you know. And uh, I think now with the benefit of hindsight, it's probably easy to say that it was an easy investment, say sub one hundred fifty dollars a share. Yeah. But I, th but I think at the time. Like you, you, you're not on Twitter, right? But if I were just browsing uh, my Twitter feed, everyone was bearish on Matter. And even when we were sub one hundred dollars a share, some people were claiming we are heading to fifty dollars a share. And I think yeah. now, with the benefit of hindsight, it might be easy to say that. But I think uh, if you were able to pick up more shares on the way down, that shows actually is maybe a strength that you have in in your investing framework. Yeah. So I'm going to say. No, and I'll explain why. Naturally, yes. I mean, no, it's no, cute. just to clear for no, you were not questioning yourself, right? No, I was not questioning myself by and large. Now, now I would keep. Yes, I questioned myself, and I would keep. It's it's human nature. Everyone says you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. You keep questioning yourself. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Am I wrong? But I never, you know, had that sell order lined up. It, it was always a buy order because I, I, I kept looking and I'd rerun the numbers. And I'm like, and this is, I'm like, people don't understand. Number yeah. one, people who never had, we'll, we'll get more into spreadsheets later on, which is why I have an issue with spreadsheets. But um, <laughs> people who never even talked about Meta, never invested in Meta before, suddenly all had opinions on Meta. Oh, it's going to zero. I'm like, you don't know the first thing about the business. And, and your opinion is that it's bad clearly actually may, maybe it's good because if someone doesn't have an opinion and now suddenly they have an opinion um i i take issue with that i remember like monish pabrai i don't want to hate on monish pabrai i'm actually eh, i don't know i'm a little iffy on him but regardless um yeah. that so anyway yeah. but he was saying uh I, what's the guy's name ash aswath yeah Don, the Indian don't guy. Know. yeah yeah him exactly so so i remember he had an interview this is around you know early maybe 2022 or whatever he had an interview with monish probably monish probably never discussed meta at all um so maybe I just highly for those doubt... who, who don't know him he's like sometimes referred to as the dean of valuation i think i think he's a mm -hmm. professor in new york if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. and uh, written a lot of books and papers on on valuation that are rather yeah. academic in nature yeah, I'd have to go back to to make sure I'm talking about. There, there's two different guys I'm I'm thinking of. I I, I sometimes get okay. their names confused. The one I'm talking about was actually an early, uh, early um developer for for Meta. Um, so I think oh, yeah, you know, we're talking. Else. Yeah, Wasn't we're talking about two different guys. Um, Renton from You Money had on his chat his channel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I guess yeah. one that was his name. Uh, anyway, irrelevant. He he yeah. was interviewing Monish. Monish was talking. Um giving his two cents on the business and he's like well like he didn't think anything was going to work out or whatever and was saying i wouldn't be buying the company right now and i'm like but like if everyone now has an opinion that's negative about meta like i don't know it it, it made me question it made me dig deeper and then like i was like no no one understands the business cycle number one clearly because the the company you can value the business, but it's obviously every business cycle has its ups and downs. And I was like, this is the, uh, the revenues coming in from ad revenues and stuff. They were bad, but like, it wasn't nearly as bad as everyone was making it seem. Um, Mark Zucker, the company doesn't have debt, so you don't have to worry about the company going bankrupt. Mark Zuckerberg is still extremely focused, keeps talking. What CEOs and founders do you know that keep talking about the next 10 to 20 years? Like Mark yeah, Zuckerberg. That's what I, still, I was thinking of when you like, were talking about WhatsApp. 
I think yeah. basically that's an investment only a founder could make. I'm not sure yeah. when he bought it. When was that? I don't know. Like I, I forget. Exactly. More than 10 years ago, or maybe yeah. around 10 years ago. And I think he paid 20 billion, right? Oh, it was a ridiculous valuation. Yeah, because I remember it was crazy when they paid like a billion for Instagram and then they paid like 20 billion for, for basically that yeah. they are just now starting to monetize it. And we're mm -hmm. really losing hard to quantify it for me, but a lot of money every single year just running the service, right? Yeah, so that's an investment only a founder can make. With exactly. Long term. Horizon. Exactly. But the guy, he's still he's what he's what, 40 years old. He's still extremely hungry. He's proven, you know, that he's a winner. And like I said, winners generally keep winning as long as they're not frauds. Um, and I mean, he's just super hungry and stuff. And I'm like, and he's and he's by and large the larger shareholder. And I'm like, do you really think this guy is going to run this this golden goose into the ground? Like, I highly doubt it. And I think if he's doing something and, you know, he tries and tries and tries and it just doesn't work out, I think eventually he'll end up folding. You yeah. know, I, I don't think he's... Gonna... So, yeah, I just thought everything was completely overdone. Um, So, yeah. The way I viewed it back then, when was it, like, say, late 2022? I think at some point they had no free cash flow. So, basically, free cash flow margins dropped to, to zero. But mm -hmm. as you said, if you understand the business, you know that the... Or you will know that the advertising business is super profitable. I think they've articulated that basically they produce, I think, operating margins of around 50%. And if you took like maybe a somewhat conservative approach and just based on the revenue, um, we're calculating with the 30% operating margin, the stock was trading below 10 times. I think I think at the bottom, closer to like six to seven times the profits generated just by the, by the ad business. And I think yeah. that if you thought about it this way, it was a no-brainer. But yeah, it's it's hard to maintain that perception when everyone is claiming that the business will will go. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult. But like I said, if you know if you know what you're investing in, and like I said, they don't have debt. Debt makes you question a lot of things, which we can get into a little bit later. But yeah, no debt, founder led, high quality business. I'd go on. I go on Instagram and Facebook and stuff and everyone's still using it completely normal just because the stock price is down doesn't mean everyone's just suddenly not posting to Instagram or yeah. Facebook or anything, you know? So I was like, this is a little crazy. Oh, well, this goes back to your scuttlebutt research. Yeah. It, it, yep. For sure. Yeah. Awesome. So there was one question actually from the community. Let's just have a look to what extent we already answered it. Uh, so it was, uh, I should ask you about your philosophy regarding the market being manic depressive. And specifically, specifically regarding matter and what you think about the company. And then he wrote, I figured that the market's mood swings with matter are largely due to the share structure that results in perceived gov corporate government's issues. So I think, I think what he's referring to is the structure of the voting shares at matter. That's the way I oh, mean, that's meaning Mark, the fact that Mark Zuckerberg owns X amount of the, the stock, but owns like the lion share of the the voting yeah yeah that way he's yeah, yeah um that's, that that's irrelevant to me i actually prefer that so going back to boston beer company um jim cook who, who's the founder owns i want to say roughly 20 percent of the shares outstanding but he owns 100 percent of the voting shares he he is the, the, so so if you're investing in the business you are investing in jim cook at that point um but that's me personally who's not an entrepreneur, who knows I'll never start a business that's phenomenal. I don't want these moronic Wall Street analysts and, and different hedge funds and stuff coming in, messing up a business. I, I, I prefer the guy who started the business 20, 30 years ago and who's made it a wonderful business that we're currently looking at continue to keep it a wonderful business. Um, I'd, I'd far prefer to hang my hat up on that guy. Um, so yeah, the share structure like that doesn't... Um, doesn't well, really like bother that. me. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, certainly going back to the manic depressive though. Yeah. W Wall Street is especially, I know we talk about, um, I know it's mentioned a lot, smaller companies, you know, will have very large swings in it and stuff. Those swings can be very quick though. Yeah. Um, with large cap companies, you have to realize Wall Street, a lot of this game is, is understanding psychology and, and Wall Street is very, short-term minded if, if they talk about the long term they're talking about the next 12 months if i'm yeah. talking about the short term i'm talking about the next 12 months if i say oh the company is going to have a uh, the, they'll have 
you know another company i own might even be one to two years right the short yeah, yeah yeah so like another company i own is revolve and I'll, I'll talk about oh yeah over the short term that business is really really bad for them just due to where we are in the economic cycle i am talking about the next one to two years meaning short term i'm not talking about the next you know one to two months you know or one to two quarters even so so wall street um just their incentives are completely misaligned uh and they they often do group think and you have to realize they have to report to to clients and so th they can't hold a loser in their portfolio for too long if they hold it for too long then they end up having to sell which puts more downward pressure and then also you just have morons using crazy leverage and stuff too so naturally you have just these absolutely ridiculous swings in share prices and and then the large caps as you saw i mean even on the downside or upside i mean on the upside you have nvidia you had tesla a few years ago um but on the downside you'll have things like meta right dollar general like another good example like i said i'm not invested in that but it same concept um just yeah that wall street is largely manic depressive yeah for sure yeah i, I think you can see it yeah I was just thinking of a blog post of Robert Vinal. I think you, you probably know him, right? So uh, yeah, oh, yeah, I love Rob. Yeah, yeah. So in, in one of his blog posts, he had one section titled "Even Mega Cap Stocks Are Frequently Mispriced," and I think he was spot on there. So even there, as as you just said, um, especially when it comes to smaller private investors, um, often people suggest to focus on the smaller cap space because you are not compete competing with institutional investors. But I think even in the uh, larger cap and mega cap space, there are frequently attractive opportunities. Yeah, definitely. Um, another example I always think of is is Apple. I like to think in 2010, 2011, I I was just a child, right? I wasn't. How old are you I, I was, now, Andrew? I, I, I'm I'm 27. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 27 oh, wow. right now. Yeah. So so in 20. 2010, I just graduated eighth grade. So 2011, I was a freshman in high school. Um, I like to think if I took my, and this is why I love my investment approach now, is because I apply it to the past. And then I said, would I have been able to identify these companies in the past, which gives me conviction that, that I'll be able to find more opportunities in the future. So I never would have been able to I would have been able to understand Amazon as a great business, but I wouldn't have been able to, the valuation never would have lined up with, with how I value businesses. Yeah. Okay. I would have missed Amazon. Yeah. But for example, an Apple, an Apple, would I have been able to pick Apple? Okay. I was, like I said, eighth grade freshman in high school. Everyone had iPhones. They were the biggest thing. They were still innovating. Everyone had the, um, the, the Mac was a massive thing. Um, iTunes was huge, right? And if you look at the financials, so when was that business? That? Oh, sorry if you said. Right. Right. Well, I'm just saying, tw tw 2011, right? If you look, yeah. so I like to buy typically. I just normally like to consider price to earnings and forward price to earnings. Um, I I I make sure those earnings are quality earnings yeah. that they're not overstated. But that that's basically how I'll, I'll I'll value a business. And I mean, you could have picked up Apple. I mean, even in when did Buffett make his investment? 2016 was it? Yeah, certainly. Later. I mean. Yeah, so for like five years straight, Apple was trading at low double-digit earnings multiples. So I mean, yeah. you would have been able to to pick up on that, and and, and I like so to think, did, okay, did Microsoft? I think at least yeah, Micro Microsoft, Microsoft did as well too. Yeah, and and if you understood that Microsoft, I, once again, if I was a high school kid, I understood that Microsoft owned Xbox and and you know uh, yeah. Windows and and things like th these are companies that you could have. You didn't have to be a Wall Street genius to understand that these were really high quality businesses. And then if you just understood just basic earnings and, and mm -hmm. price to earnings ratios and basic valuation metrics, you could have been like, hmm, this is obviously cheap. But when things are cheap, it's like, oh, no, I think they're cheap for a reason. Yeah. Whereas my approach is, no, I, I don't even have to look crazy into the numbers like this is a really top top dog business and it's just trading extremely cheap. Do you so. think there's like a gene for, for this, for having the ability to have that contrarian perception when everyone else is thinking, oh, no, business? Yeah, going um, I've I've kind of always been a, a little shit in that way, though. Like I've always if someone said if someone if some like a teacher in school would say, oh, this is the right way to do this math problem. I, I was that little jack wagon that was just like, 
well, I found a different way to do it. it you know, so I, I've kind of always been that way. But I, um, yeah, you definitely need to, you don't need to, to have a kind of, um, you don't have to be ignorant or anything like that. But you do have to, you do have to have conviction in, in your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. Like you, you do have to be strong willed and, and build your own conviction for sure. Um, I think that's very important. And, and like I say, you do also have to, I personally, personally believe you do have to be somewhat obsessive. And I'm not saying obsessive in the way I do my approach, but I mean, you do have to constantly want to learn more about investing. You have to constantly, you have to naturally be curious, I think. Like I, I'm a very curious person. If there's something I, I remember one time I stayed up until two in the morning trying to understand how dishwashers worked just because I was like, how are my dishes actually getting washed? Like this doesn't make sense to me. And I was just like, video yourself, uh, oh yeah. Go bros in exactly. inside the dishwasher, right? <laughs> That's exactly what it was. Yeah. So I just like, you just have to be naturally curious, I think, and, and be able to, to, you know, build your own conviction. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we were just talking about different investing horizons. And as you are just 28, obviously, you have a very long term investing horizon. But there was one question uh, from my subscribers, too, which I will just um, throw in here. So he wrote, how does he think about midterm investments, i.e. investments with a time horizon of two to five years? Is it mainly using government bonds? Or are there other financial vehicles to consider? Okay, so that's, that's a good question. Kind of lost me in the back end of it, though. Good question, meaning thinking of shorter term investments, so two to five years. Uh, the government bonds, though, I, I wouldn't buy bonds personally. I'm not. I'm not a bond have trader you ever or anything. Any, any bond? I have never. I, I. I. Well, I keep my cash in in a bond ETF. It's a float. It's F L O T. Um, and it's a variable rate. So instead of buying, you could buy treasuries or something too, if you want to keep your cash in to get a 5% yield. This pays out monthly. It's a 5% yield and, and it's uh, invested in uh, um, great uh, A grade um, bonds. Mm -hmm. And it's like extremely diversified. So it's just, it's yeah. the bond, the bond coupon just fluctuates up interest. and down with the interest rate. Yeah, exactly. So that's where I put my cash right now, earning about 5%. Um, but... Yeah, so other than that, I don't do any bond investing or anything like that. However, the two to say five years, I like to say maybe closer to three to five years. But um, most of my investments, I'll go into very few do I think I can actually see that business out 10 years and 10 and more than 10 years. So I know everyone loves to say I'm a long term investor. Well, I'm I'm a long term investor too, but quite frankly, most businesses just it's it's the nature of capitalism. Most businesses will not be great businesses ten years from now. Yeah. Um. So, like, in my portfolio, if you said there's only how many companies are you you had to say hold a gun to my head right now, and you have to be a hundred percent certain that business will be around ten years from now. The only one I think I could actually say that for would be something like Boston Bear, just because yeah. of the way the business, you know, the 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 um the category and the industry operates yeah. in and the way it's run. Uh, even Meta, I'm confident it will be around ten years yeah. from now. It, but but technology technology is tough, right? Yeah. So most of my businesses, I look three to five years out, and then if I think no, this thing will definitely be around ten years from now, then I can then you can actually pay slightly up for that price because of the compounding nature. Um, you're not actually going to really benefit from compounding three to five years out. So I know we love to talk about long-term investments, compounding, this and that. But if you actually just understand basic basic mathematics, um, you're not going to really benefit from the compounding, which is why you actually have to, you have to pay for the growth and you have to pay uh, you have to buy that growth relatively cheap. So you get the the multiple re-rating plus the growth over those three to five years. And if it ends up being a better business in five years from now than you could have ever expected, mm -hmm. then you can continue to hold and you know benefit from those compounding effects down the line. Um, but yeah, most businesses, I'm actually honestly just looking three to five years and I'm like, is this is this business business gonna be you know bigger three to five years from now? Um, yeah. And if so, and it's trading cheap and it's a high quality business. Um, so, so one good example is a company like Yeti. Yeti dropped down to um, 
about a 10 forward price to earnings ratio when when the CFO ended up leaving and they also had like an issue with recalls and stuff. And, and Yeti is a, a top quality brand with like a cult like following great balance sheet. Uh, the founders are not on the board or anything, but they're actually still active in the day-to-day -day operations. Um, so, so kind of ticked at every one of my boxes, yeah. I can keep up with, with the product in stores and everything. Um, and again, it, and then ended up trading at like a 10 to 10 forward price to earnings ratio, uh, super yeah. cheap for a business like that. But if you ask me where Yeti is going to be five years from now, I think they'll be much bigger. And I, I do think that they'll be around 10 years from now, but I, I, I don't know for certain that they'll be around 10 years yeah. from now. I guess that's uh, when you start thinking of probabilities, right? Yeah. Maybe not a hundred percent certain, but 90%. And, and then mm -hmm. if the valuation makes sense, that's enough. Yeah, exactly. So if, if you're buying things with a shorter price, a uh, shorter time horizon, you really have to focus on the price mm -hmm. that you're paying. If you're yeah. thinking 10 plus years out, it's almost entirely based on the quality of the business. Yeah. Um, so you kind of, it is an art form. You kind of have to to understand where you are and how long you're really expected to hold that business. None of the business yeah, I, think, I know we I think it was about. Buffett who said that time is the friend of the good business, right? I think exactly. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, there's just not that many good businesses out there. And even if you think they are, 10 years from now, they a lot of them won't be as good of a business as as it was 10 years ago. So yeah. Yeah. I think all you have to do is take a look at the 10 largest companies starting each decade and then take a look at the updated list 10 years later. And oftentimes you will see new names on that list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just to provide one example. So you were just talking about paying up and a little bit about uh valuation multiples and earlier you kind of hinted at the fact that would you would like to talk about your evaluation approach and your um the fact that you dislike spreadsheets can you elaborate on that a little bit yeah so so Already funny enough smiling yeah funny enough i always started with spreadsheets that's when i was learning to value invest and trying to it was always a spreadsheet i actually still have the spreadsheet today on on my google sheets and i have all the algorithms typed in and stuff um <laughs> But what I've realized is, number one, not a single company founder is going to value their business based on the spreadsheet. Um, so when you say and if you spreadsheet, want, are you uh, thinking of discounted cash flow? And also yeah, discounted cash flow, discounted earnings. You, you don't need to because whatever, and, and you're going to notice this over the business cycle. Every spreadsheet, every single spreadsheet, this is just... Think outside, right? Think independently for a second. And I know I I I think you actually use spreadsheets too. So don't don't yep. think I'm I'm hating on no, you guys. I think, I think you have to be aware of he, the advantages and the drawbacks. He, here's the issue I have with spreadsheets: is when I when I buy a business, I'm just thinking, okay, am I getting a fair price for this? Yes or no? And then, or or is it even cheap? Okay, great. If it if I think it's like obviously cheap, even better. But now I'm just gonna my investment is going to ride along with, with the ups and downs of the business. If you're a founder of a business, businesses naturally have up and down years. I mean, even at, like I, I've read a book on Jim Cook, the founder of the Boston Beer Company. He had like a four-year stretch with absolutely no growth. And, and he was worried that, he, you know, the business was never going to reach growth again or or whatever. Like there's there's constantly up and downs in a in a business cycle, even great businesses have their ups and downs. So when you punch numbers into a spreadsheet, and this was the issue with with Meta uh, one or two years ago, was everyone had their spreadsheet models, and they're like, "Oh, I'll be conservative. I'll be uh, I'll be conservative, and instead of saying it's going to grow fifteen percent a year, I'm going to be conservative and say it only grows 10 percent a year from now." So they take the current revenues, earnings, whatever you want to use, free cash flow, and then extrapolate that in a perfect line upward, up and to the right. <laughs> and a lot of business, a lot of businesses do grow perfectly up and to the right. But the issue is what happens? Okay, if you were running your numbers based on free cash flow, and then the year later, free cash flow just went to zero, or you saw all these people like changing the numbers in their spreadsheet. Oh well. Business is bad this year, so now we have to drop down our estimated future growth by fifty percent or something. You know, just crazy yeah, that's what, things. What, what price targets are based on, in a way, right? Yeah. So, so, so every... let's uh, revise them lower, like significantly lower. Business, yeah, doing well 
well, we're just going to increase the price mm -hmm. higher, but that's usually when it's too late already. Yeah, so so um, I just have an issue with spreadsheets, not because like the spreadsheet concept is bad. Like I understand a discounted cash flow, like mathematically, it makes sense. I, I understand. My problem is, is that businesses don't grow up into the right perfectly. So all you really have to focus on, and once again, going back to the simplicity approach, mm -hmm. I don't need to punch numbers into a spreadsheet. I just need to understand, if I understand that we're not at peak business, right? And I've made mistakes before too. It looks cheap, but turns out those are peak earnings. Those are unrealistic earnings. And those earnings are going to drop 50% before they get back to normal, right? You could, you're going to make the same mistake in a spreadsheet too. You might say, oh, well, I think we're at peak multiple here. So I'm only going to grow revenues out 3%. Well, sorry, bud, but revenues just actually dropped 50% the year after because you're in a bubble or something like that. Um, so kind of forgot where I was going with this, quite quite frankly. Um, oh, oh, yeah. So as, as long as I get like a business um, cheap enough, like as long as I know we're not in a bubble territory and then I don't like to pay more than 18 times forward earnings um but typically and even if i can get less than 15 oh, did you great. At, at, at like the 18 figure yeah so so this is fun too um a lot of people will say well we're just this is another issue you please think outside the box i, I inform I, I want everyone to think outside the box another issue i have how many YouTube videos have you watched where people say, well, the historical average oh, yeah. for the, the stock market is 15 to 16 times earnings. Okay, number one, those are based on, well, take interest rates aside because interest rates are, are very difficult to predict. We don't know where those are going to go. I don't consider interest rates at all, really. But take interest rates aside. Okay, so you're saying the average S&P 500 company has traded at uh, 15 to 16 times earnings historically. Okay, good. That's a good starting point. What did the average S&P 500 company look like? Well, S&P 500 over a very long time delivers maybe 6 to 8%, right? Historically, we'll call it 8%. I think that's a fair number we can use. Okay, so you're telling me the company is growing 8% a year. The Historically, they have far more debt than they do cash. They're usually leveraged at, at, least, at least one and a half times, right? Okay, so they have more debt. Founders are usually not involved anymore. They're usually hired guns because once they get to a certain size, the, the founder ends up taking a backseat. Mm -hmm. So founders are not involved. Um, and, and so you just start looking at all of these qualitative factors. What is the average S&P 500 company? And then you focus on my approach, which is our very high quality businesses. They don't deserve a multiple of 15 or 16 times. They deserve, they get, they get, um, well, they have more growth, so they deserve a higher multiple for the more growth. They have a way cleaner balance sheet, which means they're not going to go bankrupt. So they, they deserve a higher multiple for that, um, because you're paying for a safety factor. If the founder's around, you should get a higher multiple for that because you, you have a guy who knows the business inside and out that you can rely on. Right. So, so you start tacking on. So most of my businesses deserve, in my opinion, to trade mid to high 20s multiple so i don't like to pay higher than a forward multiple of like 18 though just to to have that you know natural margin of safety but um yeah if i'm paying like an 18 forward multiple it's usually a business that i have to see that can that can be around about you know 10 years from now or so so boston beer and meta i think are like the only two recently that i've paid that i have multiple for most of these companies i'm paying sub 15 price forward price to earnings ratios for yeah so, so are you aiming for like a specific return like when you say 18 I, 18 I, earnings the way i think of it is that's probably like five to six times at five to six percent earnings yield then you add in some growth um so is it like 10 percent like um to be on the conservative side no so if i think a business is going to grow this is what the way my brain works so so if i'm buying a business at say for example yeti that one was super easy right it, i ended up buying it about a 10 or 11 forward price to earnings ratio i thought fair value was at least not forward multiple current multiple was at least probably 
low twenties, high teens anyway, high teens, low twenties. So I thought right off the bat it was there's a hundred percent return, just a multiple re rating. Um, and then I thought if I and then if you hold it longer, so you hold it past the multiple re rating, you'll get the growth of the business. So I figured it might grow. The management targets double digits, so just call it 10%. So it might grow another 10% after that. But I wouldn't want it if it was just growing 10% and that was it. It was really a a multi most of my investments are actually multiple re-ratings that I'm buying. Um, but I'm giving myself a safety net of three to five years because they're quality businesses. So I'm like, okay, well, even if the like even if Meta was still super cheap today, trading at single digits earnings multiple, I I'd be okay holding it because the business is still growing. Yeah, I don't want to hold a stagnant big business just because it's cheap, yeah. right? So, yeah. but I, I don't have like discount rates and stuff. Once again, that's like a spreadsheet type thing. I am aware, like mentally aware of how, how much could this business realistically return to me. Um, But it's not like, I don't have like a mathematical approach to it. It's just back of the napkin math. Like, okay, I think there's... I think it's 50% undervalued right now. And then I'll get, you know, an extra 10, 15% of growth every year on top of it, you know? So awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So Andrew, I know that you have some, some plans with your wife today. So maybe yeah, let's wrap it up with, with one last uh, question. Actually, actually I have two. Um, okay. Maybe, yeah. Maybe, maybe first of all, what advice would you give to someone who's just starting to get into value investing? Any like high level advice for someone who's, who's new? <laughs> so if you're new, um first off keep it simple <laughs> um but i would say focus on f find a find an investor that you that resonates with you so for me it was peter lynch i know everyone glorifies warren buffett and and guys like that and gr trust me they're great you can learn a bunch from them mm -hmm. um but but find one that that makes sense to you and and for me it was always peter lynch and it, it's not even all of peter lynch's methods he loves cyclicals and turnarounds and different companies like that but but um you know that certain scuttlebutt approach that he had and understanding the price to earnings to growth ratio meaning you companies will return as much as the the business can grow earnings like i that all made sense to me so just find something that makes sense to you and dig extremely deep into it. And once again, you have to be obsessive, meaning I'm not saying you have to obsess over the, the stock price up and down. I'm saying you have to obsess over wanting to learn more. Um, I, th I think that's that's like the main thing that separates, you know, the the you know, some of us from, from the average or whatever, you know, and, and I, I mean, it applies to everything. I mean, there's a drum set behind me too. If you have a guy that hops on the drum set, you know, once a month or whatever mm -hmm. he might be a good drummer or something but he, i i think the guy that constantly puts the work in and practices you know an hour or two every single day i think over the long run he'll be a far better drummer than the other guy you know yeah. um so yeah and it, but investing is great because you don't need natural talent really mm -hmm. um it's not like a sport or an instrument sometimes natural talent yeah, helps. That's a great point yeah yeah, investing, you don't need a special talent. You don't need to be a whiz. I, I work construction. I I mean, I had good grades in school. I don't and think I you come across as someone who's not like super smart, but... Yeah, but I, so, I appreciate that. Thank you. But my point being, I don't... I have a college degree. It's a basic associate's degree. Um, mm -hmm. it, It's not... Like, I didn't go to school. I didn't take any accounting. I, ne I did not know at all how to read a balance sheet or an income statement whatsoever. Yeah, thank um, you. yeah, but yeah, Everything, you just everything self taught. Yeah. So, so just keep it simple and constantly work at it and find something that makes sense to you. Find, find a concept that makes sense to you. Maybe my concept doesn't make sense to you guys, but you know, just find something that makes sense to you and just, just go all in on it and learn as much as you can. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And then the last question. So let's see how, how people enjoy our conversation, but if they do, um, I might end up doing more interviews. And as the channel, it's not the channel name, but in my introduction, I always write mental models, wealth building, right? And I really like the concept of mental models. So what what I have in mind is like always ask one final question, which is uh, what's your favorite mental model? Do you have one? Um, I, I have two for you. You did pitch this question to me beforehand, so I, I had to write them down. Um, well, 
I guess one mental, I don't know if you'd classify it as a mental model, but working, understanding consumer trends and trying to realize, is this a trend, like a long-term trend, or is this a fad? Um, so that's one mental model that's just constantly running in my head all the time whenever I'm looking at an investment. Um, so so, what, so what maybe like a product like Peloton? Fall into this yeah, that, that was obviously a fad. If you just learn, look in history, workout equipment has always been a fad. I, I don't know a single workout equipment that has not been a fad. Um, but that, yeah, so I mean, some of this is just kind of common sense. But yeah, that's just like understanding is this a long term trend or a fad? Sometimes I miss the trend because mm -hmm. I think it's a fad. So a good example would be Crocs. Mm -hmm. It's it's a shoe that everyone's wearing in the company. Growth, great balance sheet, super cheap. It was right in my wheelhouse. But I never invested because I was like, eh, I don't know if this is a long term trend. This kind of seems like a little one time fad to me. And so far, I've been proven wrong. So um, we'll see. But yeah, yeah that's just... I'm not sure if you've seen it. Uh, Birkenstock. Like, I'm not, not sure how you Americans would pronounce it. I, I American or Canadian, by the way. Oh, I'm American. Yeah. American. Yeah. So have you heard of that Birkenstock? Do you know these shoes? No, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send you like a link after the interview. Yeah. Also, basically a shoemaker for sandals, basically. Mm -hmm. And I have to dig deeper, but I think they've also been around for, for decades and they recently went public. So basically oh. just now, and uh, I think they might also be an attractive investment, like strong brand, but at the same time, I would probably feel the way, same way as you did regarding Crocs, like a specific type of shoe, like hard for me to, to have yeah. to form. Well, my issue with Crocs, yeah, Cro Crocs has been around forever like since i was yeah. a child i was my wife and i were just watching a movie from like the early 2000s and you saw crocs hanging up on the wall like in the background of one of the scenes and i was like no one ever cared about crocs up until like a few years ago so i, I, I say that my girlfriend just told me yesterday that uh, birkenstock shoes were basically like i'm not sure if it was a product placement but really highlighted in the recent barbie movie so oh yeah rocks in a way here yeah yeah so so once again but you you won't always be right you won't always be right. You just have to be right on the things that you need to be right about. So if I'm putting money into it, I need to be right about it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, but yeah, so that's the first mental model that's kind of constantly running in my head. Is this a fad or is this a long-term trend? Um, and then I think just inversion. And I know that's, that's a Charlie Munger mental model that he always talks about inversion, but it's true. I, I've, I, I think inversion is great. Um, I know we didn't get around to all of the the questions that that you mentioned but but one of them was you know a flopped investment and stuff most of my quality factors are part of my checklist now due to mistaken investments so so early uh 20 late 2019 into early 2020 right before covid hit um i made a very large investment into cruise lines the debt looked okay debt to equity ratio was fine but um I didn't really look at the quality, but but it just had some serious debt issues. Uh, if the business stopped, yeah, if the business stopped and the business did stop, and that my investment, I didn't lose all my money, but it virtually went to zero, and it was like the number one position in my portfolio. So so learn to hard learn that so the hard way. The question you've now added to your checklist based on that experience. Oh it, it, oh, balance sheet. Yeah, you can't go. And Peter Lynch put it so beautifully. Uh, it's tough for a business to go bankrupt if they have no debt. So I'm not saying the company has to have no debt, but at least have enough cash around to yeah. cover that debt in case that debt is for whatever reason called or your business operations suddenly stop for any black swan event. Um, yeah, have have some cash around, you know, uh, have enough cash to pay that. Um, so 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 that's one of the things I, I constantly look for growth um, due to the issue. I bought, you know, cheap stocks because they were cheap, but then they just kept getting cheaper and cheaper all the way down to zero. So buying, you know, just, just invert. What don't you want to happen in your investments? What do you think could go wrong? And then avoid those things, flip it on its head and avoid those things, you know? So. Awesome. So Andrew, yeah. thanks a lot for, for taking the time. Um, just to maybe let the viewers know that they should really appreciate you taking the time. It's still fairly early at your place, right? I'm not sure you uh, get up earlier than usually today just for No, the no. Well, my wife and I have a couple of cats and one of them is is Biggie, we call him because he's a big fatty. I think I, he... I saw that on interview uh, on, yeah. on Instagram. Like, yeah. He... Very large cat. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. He's like 20 pounds. Yeah. He's huge. A, a regular cat is like around 10 pounds. So, okay. um, wow. 
Yeah, yeah, he's massive. But anyway, yeah, he's a big fatty. So every morning he he meows and 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 licks your face until you go feed him. So yeah, I, I, I'm on a pretty solid routine with that one. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So thank you very much, Andrew. And maybe the the viewers can let us know how they enjoyed that or this. Yeah, one. yeah, and hopefully I can come back to YouTube soon. So we'll, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see maybe 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 people should comment and ask you to come back because I think you would add a lot of value to the to the investing space on, on YouTube. Ah, thanks.